Thank you, Henry, and uh, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I just want to welcome everybody. We had a, for those that could make it last night, we had a beautiful sunset, really special evening, and uh, got this thing kicked off properly. And this morning, uh, I'm honored to be up here with three esteemed panelists from our industry. Many of you know them. I'm going to give them a chance to introduce themselves briefly. Um, but our aim here with this panel is really just to set the stage for the course, what we, what we plan to cover over the course of the next three days. We have 200 plus CEOs of early stage companies that are all out there uh, growing companies, uh, seeking financing and trying to change the world. We have a very good turnout from the investment community. I hope you do some deals. Um, and we have really good representation from the strategic community as well. So we really have all of the pieces here today. And through this panel, we have perspectives from folks that have been on multiple sides of the table uh, we have Leslie here uh, running a company that's having a tremendous amount of success. And uh, we chatted prior to this uh, session, and we, you know, we said we have multiple people here. Who do we really want to focus on? And uh, I'll admit it to you that uh, my heart is with all of you, but it's really, really, truly with the entrepreneur. So our discussion here today hopefully shed some light on what's happening in the industry, and we want to uh, guide everybody here and, again, welcome you for being here. So let's... Uh, Let's start with Jay, and we'll come back down. Maybe quick bios, and then we'll, we'll jump into it. Yeah, I um, uh, thank you, Scott, and thank you to LSI for bringing this community together. Uh, it's been uh, heartening, uh, encouraging uh, uh, to, to be able to look out over the reception last night and see the community together, which perhaps we may have taken for granted um, is a fantastic thing. So I'm very appreciative of that and the opportunity to be with all of you. Um, my background, um, I, I have been on uh, pretty much all sides of the table. Uh, began in the industry as an entrepreneur, founded a company that was bought by Eli Lilly. We became part of Guidant when it spun out. Uh, I thought I would stay there three weeks. I stayed there about 10 years. Uh, at Guidant, um, subsequently went into the investment side. Uh, today I'm with uh, a, a new venture firm called Sonder Capital, where uh, a small group of partners are trying to do very, very early stage work. Great. Um, thanks, Scott. I'm Leslie Trague. I'm the CEO of Outset Medical. I started my career at Guidant. Always aspired to meet Jay, and it finally happened today. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, after Guiden, I did a succession of startups, um, mostly in the cardiology space, with a, a little dabble into breast cancer diagnostics, but um, got involved with Outset, which was originally known as Home Dialysis Plus, in 2012 as an executive in residence for Warburg Pincus. They made a very early stage, small for them, just 40 million, um, Series A investment. Um, for a pile of components on the table. And I remember saying to the former previous CEO, you know, what, what is that? He's like, oh, that's a dialysis machine for home. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, we have a lot of work to do here. But that was 2012, and um, fast forward, we've made, you know, a lot of progress since then. So I've been CEO since 2014. And thank you as well, Scott. I'm Paul LaViolet, managing partner with uh, Hes SV Health Investors. I've been in the med tech space since 1980, uh, 29 years as an operator, now 13 years as an investor. I didn't have a direct uh, connection uh, with Guidant uh, until uh, actually we bought it. <laughs> that, until that. So uh, that was, uh, I guess we're all in the same bucket eventually. <laughs> so uh, just delighted to be here with all of you. All right, great. We're going we're gonna to tee this up with Paul. Paul, you and I chatted about a year ago. You were virtual. We were yes. here. We promised a good sunset. We delivered it last night, I believe. Um, <laughs> What's changed since last year? Top level, what, what are some of the key things that, uh, that have changed in your mind, just in the climate overall? Well, I would say from a med tech perspective, uh, if you think about a year ago, uh, and if you pulled in the bankers, they would have been queuing up a list of IPO candidates. Uh, the market was hot. Um, there was a derivative dynamic with SPACs. That was hot. Um, obviously, IPO valuations pull forward uh, private uh, valuations, so there was a lot of fervor. Um, I'd say a year later, that's receded uh, quite a bit. There is still a lot of capital 
Uh, strategics are still recovering from some revenue hits uh, of, of the pandemic, but cash flows are strong. But the overall, I, I'd say, uh, size and scale of the investment appetite is a little bit uh, pulled back as a function of the loss of the IPO window for not only medtech, biotech, the same, there, there's essentially no uh, listing activity. And um, I would say that, that compresses things a little bit. Okay, and uh, Jay. You've been through a few cycles yourself. What hasn't, what hasn't changed? What, what are the things that don't change? Yeah, I, um, uh, uh, I, 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 have, um, I have the same sort of perspective as Paul, I, uh, I, I suppose, to, a, to an extent. I mean, there is, there is um, there's evidence of a, of a little bit of a pullback, but I can also um, frame it in a, in a somewhat different context. I mean, I, um, I remember in 96 where you could take pretty much anything public um, in medtech, and we did. Um, many of those companies disappointed investors, I think is a kind way to say it. Uh, and, and then we, you know, we, we created a, an experience for investors that they couldn't really make money in medtech. And I think that, um, that experience took a while to work through. Uh, if you looked at t 2007, 2008, you know we had a we had a real setback in terms of capital availability, and it was quick. I mean, it it put the pullback then was very very significant. I think uh, part of what has happened out there today, in in my view, is that in that in that 10 years since um, sitting here today, we've managed to prove a th few things at, as an industry. Um, one of which is that you actually can make money in medtech. And I think if you, I mean, I keep a little list on my phone of those, those startups, albeit public ones, that have managed to achieve a, a billion dollar valuation. That was a really short list in 1996. Today, it's a, uh, with companies like Leslie's, it's a, it's a, a somewhat lar larger list. We have rounds today in, in medtech that the headline number is like what companies used to get bought for. It's 100 million plus round. And, and we didn't just have one of them. In, in the past 10 years, we've had many of them, arguably. And so where, where, does, where does my confidence that we will have some continuation of the investment uh, environment that we've enjoyed for the last 10 years, it comes from that. I think, we're, I think we've created some experiences that show we can, we can create um, value, uh, we can uh, make investors money, uh, and, and, and we've done it in a, in a way which I think will endure for a while. Um, that said, investors, I mean, one of my, one of my uh, Concerns, and I can say this because, like Leslie, I've been out, and like many of you, begging for money. I've done that. Um, one of my concerns is that when I when I talk to investors and they go, well, "As you see, what happened to the Nasdaq today?" and I go, "Man, we're talking venture capital here. I mean, we didn't even ship this thing for five years from now. So, so I'd like to I'd like to kind of reset the frame." in terms of investment and keep in mind that we're building value. That's great, okay. So um, let's transition to Leslie here. Outset is cranking, right? You guys are uh, double sales from 2020 to 2021, rapid growth. And uh, one of the things that I didn't know that really struck me is that you joined the company when there were four employees and I think you have well over 650 employees now. There's a lot of CEOs here who have a handful of employees and aim to get where you're at. So share with us um, something that you know now that you wish you knew then. We've had some, some conversations about this and I think it'd be really valuable for you to tee up one of those. Um, sure, it's hard to limit it to one. <laughs> um, one thing I can say definitively is that I have made more mistakes than anybody in this room. So I hope that um, my comments can make you feel better about what you're doing. <laughs> um, I, I will always be able to make you feel better. So seek me out at any time. Um, 
I, um, <clears throat> gosh, because there, there's, there are so many different mistakes, but I, I would say one, and maybe bouncing off of something you just said around fundraising, and maybe particularly in this climate, is around valuation. Um, and I may piss off one or both of you about the perspectives of companies that you're already invested in, but maybe as a new investor, you, you would endorse this point of view. I think one of the things that I've learned in hindsight is that um, valuation can really be a dangerous game. And um, if you have, and some of you may have investors around the table that are really pushing you um, or have pushed you in the past to get the highest possible valuation as the goal, and I think ego gets wrapped up in that too. But, but you know, in our case, we had an, uh, some unnamed investors who even wanted to tie the size of our employee equity pool to the valuation that we achieved in the next round. Um, the higher it was, the bigger that employee equity pool. So we fought against that and we squashed it, but that's how intense the pressure I know some of you guys are probably feeling is around valuation. I think it's really a Pyrrhic victory, honestly. Who cares? If you are 300 million or 500 million or 700 million, um, I would also really encourage you to, which I never did, do the valuation mapping all the way through. Um, and assume you will have many more rounds than you think. Um, uh, there, there is this adage about it taking you know, twice as long and twice as much capital. We defied that by taking, I mean, literally, I'm not joking, five times as much. We ended up having to raise $450 million privately, and, and I am not proud of that. Um, if I could have gotten that done for 50, I would do that all day long. Um, but it took a lot and many more rounds. We went all the way up to a Series E before taking the company public. And the only reason we went public is, I'm embarrassed to say it, is like we needed more money. <laughs> we were not done. Um, we still needed more. So now I think we're finally in a good place following an IPO and two follow-ons. So, um, so map your valuation all the way through far past. If you think, oh, we're going to do a Series C and get bought, run it out to a Series Z, a Series F, like try to look at it, which again, I did not do, from more of a worst case scenario and do the math because we, we got, and we weren't a crazy unicorn, blah, 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 but you know, we got into kind of the $600 million range on a post money basis off the Series E and then all of a sudden we started doing math around a potential IPO at that time, too late, um, because it was not looking like at that time um, and we got very lucky with market timing that we were not gonna be able to get a valuation in the public market that was, we were concerned we'd even reach 600 million. So that, that's one big lesson, one last thing. Um, I would pay attention more to terms. Because the other thing, I wish I had paid more, I wish I had read the charter. So for anybody in the room who's not a founder and didn't help draft the charter, um, if you are just a regular CEO, go back today or tonight and read your charter. I never did that. Um, so you will be surprised. You, I hope you're not, but you might be surprised. And so the, the, um, the eso, some of the more esoteric terms, like is a, is a qualified IPO in there? Um, what's the, what are the li liquidation preferences? I think everybody kind of understands, but you may have, um, what's a requisite holder? Uh, how, how are the investors gonna vote together? Is it series by series, or is it a majority of your investors that can vote together on something? I mean, these things ended up mattering a lot. Is there a accruing dividend? I never knew what an accruing dividend was. Highly, highly punitive. So um, terms, to me, in hindsight, are much more valuable, or much more important in ultimately determining some big parts of your company's future than valuation, and valuation, in fact, can really work against you. That's great. Okay, that's a lot to work with, Paul. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Listen, there's no, uh, there's no magic. I think everything Leslie said uh, resonates with me, and in, uh, in the aggregate, I think about I, taking away from those comments. It's about balance, and it's about rigor. And you learn that as you build and make mistakes. You learn that as you invest and, um, and ultimately complete a diligence and, and pull the trigger. There is, there's, no, there's no magic bullet. It's, it's not a victory, right, to raise a certain amount at a certain uh, valuation in a certain series because you don't know exactly what's going to happen in the next and the next and the next series. And the, the, the truism for MedTech is it will probably take more money and more time. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you are balanced, uh, you can anticipate, spend time trying to anticipate what might happen next, what might happen next. Uh, try to factor that into your short-term decision. Try to think about what you're building. What are, what are we building? We're not building the company for a successful Series A. That's just a step along the way. 
we're building a team, we're building a culture, we're, we're building a, a, a therapy or whatever it is to make a difference. Um, how will we ultimately attract capital the next time around, the next time around? Um, it's hard. I, I think that would be one other message. It is yeah. it organically hard in this space uh, to raise capital, build a success, exit uh, with a return for, for everyone that participated. So don't, don't assume that any step will be easy. Pursue every step uh, with balance toward the short-term achievement, but then also what might come next and how do we preserve our optionality for the long term and be super rigorous, whether it's reading the charter or interviewing the ninth candidate for a role, just be super rigorous in everything you do. Those decisions you make today as an older, whatever, statesman in the category now, those decisions you make today will, they will persist and you'll either thrive as a function of them or you'll pay a price as a function of them. So uh, n no decision is small and put everything into uh, what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Jay, you wanna? Yeah, I, you know, it's, if I had a nickel for every time I've been told this is our last round. <laughs> uh, because we've all pitched that, right? <laughs> this is all, we, we've done, and look, we're, this is our last money in. So um, I, I think I very strongly would, would agree with Paul's comment. The way I tend to look at it is, I mean, what's happening out there in the world and in, in, uh, comps and, and sort of values and kind of what's where and what was where when, these things unfold over 10 years. And, and over that period of time, that's going to move around a lot. What's not going to change are the fundamental requirements of the project that you're attached to in your startup. That never changes. It, it's still the same lift you have to do. And, and so what, when someone tells me it's the last round, the first question I have is about the operating plan because, because it is about what we understand of, of what's in front of us. I would also you know, agree with Paul's comment. Unfortunately, um, some of that we don't know. <laughs> and so, so we, we, have to, we have to go into it with some, you know, some, some level of um, suspicion about you know, how certain we are about the future, and, and that's okay. Um, I, I, I think you know, what, what's good about MedTech in, in many respects is that, look, I mean, this, this community, um, at least this community, understands what this takes. And, and like Paul said, it's hard. And you know, Leslie says she's made every mistake. If we combined all the mistakes we've made up here, um, we've, we've done all the wrong things, or at least hopefully most of them. Uh, I still have a few wrong things left. Yeah, uh, we, might, we, might, we might push the outer bounds of that. But, but look, I mean, we, we get how hard this is. Uh, and, and I think, as certainly from the investor community, um, you have a bridge there. It's, it's, it's okay that this is not the last round. It's okay. Yeah. That's great. Um, we had an interesting conversation. Uh, we were talking about, you know, we're, we're often thinking about M&A as our exit. And Leslie, you talked about this idea of know who you are and who you aren't. And your path was a little different. Can you, can you talk about what you mean by that, know who you are? Yeah, well, it maybe goes back to my background. So it's done a couple startups in, in cardiology and, and was lucky enough to have some good transactions there, you know, M&A and IPO. So I think I spent um, too long wishing that Outset was in the cardiology space. <laughs> um, <clears throat> because I'm like, where are all the acquirers? And I think in the very early beginning, and maybe some of our earliest investors, um, because it was, probably also there was not really an open IPO market at that yeah. time, yeah. Um, were kind of assuming that, well, eventually this company would get bought. It was unspoken, but, you know, and, and so the more I realized I was, I had this mindset of, of being somebody who we were not. So we had a weird dynamic, which is an enormous market, but highly consolidated and very, very few, if any, um, acquires, because one of the acquires was fully vertically integrated through services and equipment, so they were sort of off the map. So, you know, it kind of came down to like, really when you stripped it all the way to people. And I think I spent too much time pretending like that wasn't true. 
Um, and versus, I think probably what I would advise everybody to do, it's, it's hard, it's easier said than done, but to really take a hard look at your market dynamics um, and your industry specifics and, and really try to be as honest as you can um, about who, who you are and who you're not. And, and, and a part of who we were too was highly capital consuming because we were with the technology was very, very hard. There's like over 3,000 components in this thing. And then we had a really special relationship with gross margin, um, which was going to take us years to sort out. We went public with a negative 50% gross margin. Like people should, we just put a, should have put it in like a CD and people would have made more money. Um, <laughs> it was just a checking account. You know, I don't think those exist anymore. But um, so, so I, the overarching, I guess, lesson for me is be, if, I think I would have saved myself some time and been a little bit more efficient if, if I had realized earlier that I was actually not in cardiology anymore with a plethora of acquirers to, to go to. That's great. Anything you guys want to add? To that? Well, uh, we have always built in, in MedTech, uh, I think, assets for acquisition. Uh, IPO as a window, as a phenomenon, comes and goes, and it's gone much more often than, than mm -hmm. it's uh, available. So I do think the, the basic question for a company is, what, what do we do with ourselves? Yeah. And if you are building for M&A, that's great, but you, you cannot sell the company, right? The company has to be acquired. You can't make a strategic want you. And so the, the real challenge is building uh, for some durability, building uh, for, for your own uh, sustainability. And if, if and when an event uh, comes across, great. If, if there's an optimal time to sell the company, fantastic. But more often than not, those, those events don't align. And you have to be focused on what's my sustainability plan uh, if you if you do that, if you stay focused on uh, building and executing, you'll have more M and A prospects than you ever imagined. If you wake up in the morning thinking about what are my M and A prospects, they probably won't come. So stay mm -hmm. focused on the business. Let the external events occur as they as they will. Yeah, I I'd, uh, I'd just uh, offer a, cu a couple of observations there. I think to to Paul's. Comment. You got to focus on the business. Um, there, there are some, there are some things that have changed. I mean, I recall a time uh, when, when the boardroom conversation was, well, we can't, we can't fill the sales force. I mean, who can do that? You can't. I mean, we, we leave that for J and J and Medtronic um, because they have sales forces. We are the other guys. We're the, we're the front end for those sales forces, and that's what, that's what creates this. Uh, arbitrage opportunity on m and a and so so that conversation was rooted in some assumptions about what small caps could do. Mm. I would submit that some of that has changed, uh, and in fact, if you look at the last decade, we have built sales forces, some in cardiology, mm -hmm. um, some in other areas where entrenched com competition um, was was sort of stuck uh, to some degree. Uh, and where the technology platforms really did warrant uh, the kinds of investments to build sales forces. What, what's that part of? Um, my other observation is it's gotten easier to scale. Um, it's still hard to invent, and it's still hard to prove that something that you invented is valuable, but it's gotten generally easier to scale. Uh, we saw Dale's uh, presentation on, on recruiting. Um, there was a time when um, recruiting lead times were really long because we didn't have a lot of these resources. And so if we look at our, uh, ourselves as a capability in aggregate in the community, we have a lot more capability now to scale. And so I think to Paul's point, it creates some optionality that you all as entrepreneurs have that perhaps wasn't there uh, in, in times past where it was a little harder and you kind of, you know, you, you could do it, but you got boxed into that position. So I think you do have choices. Uh, and and they're, in some ways, they're better choices than you had a decade ago. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I asked uh, many of the CEOs that are here uh, to weigh in if they had any questions. And there were a couple common themes that came out of it. And one of them was, are we going to see some of the funds come in earlier, some of the corporate investors come in early? I know it varies 
uh, depending on the, the, the uh, thesis of the, the company or the fund. But generally speaking, we'll start, start with you, Paul. Are we going to see earlier investments? Is that a, a fairy tale? What, what are your thoughts on that? I hope not. Uh, I hope it's not a fairy tale. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I'm an early stage investor. <laughs> so uh, listen, it's the hardest part, right? Uh, and so the, to me, the biggest question is, how much total early stage capital is available, and what is the appetite for one single idea? Um, I think there is a mismatch between early stage investing and a, an idea that by definition is likely to take 150 or $200 million. It's very difficult to aggregate that, that kickoff capital. If, if the uh, overall capital uh, consumption of a given story is reasonably modest. I actually think there's a fair amount of capital available for that. I do think strategics, uh, and you know, we, we've always focused on the large five or ten. There's really a next generation of mm -hmm. strategics now that are large enough to to stand up uh, external innovation uh, vehicles, whether it's venture, business development, what have you, build to buys. There's more and more of that, and I and I think uh, in, um, entrepreneurs should not be overly worried about partnering earlier with strategics. It's an important um, uh, verification of the value proposition. It's an important source of capital. And, uh, and strategics understand that still, for the most part, they don't innovate. You all do. Yeah, that's great. OK, um, one of the other, so we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let us wrap up with closing remarks here for anybody that would like to make them. We ran a little bit short on time, and we want to stay on schedule. One of the other themes of questions I got here, and it was really directed at all of you guys, uh, was that um, you weren't logging into the partnering app and accepting enough meetings. So if you could consider doing that. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, in all seriousness, we have, we have three days of, of terrific <laughs> sessions lined up. And I, I hope everybody sticks around and gets a chance to ask the questions of this uh, group uh, that we weren't able to get to. But I would like to go through, and maybe we'll start with Jay and work our way back, um, hopefully. Uh, this turnout is an indicator that there's, there's uh, some health in our industry, but I'd like your, uh, your genuine take on where we're at right now, closing remarks, uh, and give us your view on, on, on the outlook, short-term outlook for us. Yeah, uh, thanks, Scott. I, and I, um, uh, what's my view of where we're at? Um, uh, I've, been, I've been doing this long enough to sort of um, look at this room and and, and what I see is what this room does in five years, because that's really what the early stage piece is all about. Um, when you apply yourself to the various needs that you are identifying out there in, in healthcare, and, and we all know there are a lot of them, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to uh, find spots to apply uh, your talents and the talents of your teams. That's not a, that's not a question. Uh, and so I, uh, it, you know, w where am I with respect to the industry and our, and our, and our outlook? I, I, am, I am very, very optimistic. What makes me, what makes me optimistic about that? We, we have a number of forces at work, and you know, one of which is you have a technology tool set that generations you know, of, of entrepreneurs would, would, be, would be jealous of. Uh, You've got these convergences of uh, technology, whether it's you know, components off the consumer side of the computer industry or whether it's you know, the whole digital world. I mean, you, know, you can ask the question, well, what happened to digital health? Well, it became all of us. Uh, and so I think there are, there are some things that, that are macro um, positives in, in that whole environment. Um, and, and on the capital side, I, I don't see a major shift, a ground shift in, in, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of capital, uh, capital availability. I, I, I think we'll be smarter than we were in 2007, 8, and 9. I don't think the pullback will be you know, sort of all stop if there is one at all. Uh, I think there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a, an appreciation, uh, I think, out there in the investing uh, uh, portion of our industry for um, the fact that th these times um, can create uh, opportunities that are that are stellar, um, uh, and and for those investors who are patient and 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 dedicated to it, and they're fortunately, as Paul is, we're 
early stage investors. Fortunately, there are a chunk of us who are playing the game early because we do believe that that's where, that's where we can kind of you know, get started on creating, creating massive valuation. It's going to swing. Um, I, I, was a, I was a corporate uh, venture capitalist in one, uh, one of those recessions. And I have to tell you, we went from, who are you guys? Uh, when I was at Guidant, I, I ran the venture portfolio. I, no one came to see us. And as soon as the recession hit, we had a line outside our door. Uh, it was crazy. And so, so the, the corporates will get an opportunity to work with you and to lean into this period of time if there's any pullback at all. Um, and to Paul's point, I would, I would, I would cultivate those, those relationships where they can be, uh, can be developed and prove useful to you. Um, because it ebbs and flows. This is about cycles in the end. It's about cycles. Uh, and and I, think you've got, I think you've got everything you need, frankly. Thank you. I'll just two quick pieces. I'll be quick. Two quick pieces of advice. One, uh, personal advice. I, I read um, a chapter. I didn't read the whole book, but I did read a chapter. I was very proud. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was written by Ben Horowitz, um, who, who went on to Andreessen Horowitz. But he was an entrepreneur for many years. I don't know him. But um, the one thing I took away, there, there was only one from this chapter, was the, the, he said the most difficult job of the CEO is to manage your own psychology. And I really, re that really resonated with me. And so if you, uh, that, you have to be able to go the distance. Um, and no, again, no one's been turned down more times than I have for financing, no, nobody in this room like over a hundred times. So, um, so, so managing that psychology, staying true to the mission, staying, staying true to the vision and, um, and not giving up. It sounds like tried advice, but, but I've, always, that's, I've always carried that with me is just manage, manage your own psychology. If you do that well, you're, you're gonna get there. Um, fundraising advice is there was an article that came out. You might wanna look it up. It was about Tiger Global and one of our investors, D1 Capital. Um, I don't even re remember how big Tiger is. D1 is like 30 billion. They're actually going earlier stage, earlier and earlier and earlier. And so when we did our first crossover round in 2015, um, nobody really was, those crossovers were only doing biotech crossovers, not med tech. So point one, that's all changed in a great way. Now it's very common for you know, Fidelity, T. Rowe, Janus, et cetera, to be in med tech. But what I see and what I'm hearing from those um, public fund guys is that they are going way into kind of series B, even Series A. So, so don't be afraid, I guess, is that don't be afraid to reach out to funds that you think are perhaps at an altitude that you can't fly at. You, you never know. And, and what I'm hearing um, just conversationally is that um, as, as public multiples are starting to, well, not starting to, we are contracting, um, those pools of capital may be moving to earlier stages in med tech. So go for it. Uh, whether you believe you can or whether you believe you cannot, you'll be right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm an optimist. I, I don't know any other way. You wake up in the morning, you have to be optimistic. You have to be in a position to go for it. But it doesn't mean you won't reach setbacks and it doesn't mean your, your uh, willingness to be right is going to change the environment. But it gives you, it gives you uh, a chance to succeed. And so you have to be optimistic. If you're not optimistic, you're in the wrong room. Um, point number one. Point number two, I believe in cycles. But overall, if you look at the last 20, 30, 40 years, med tech has just continuously expanded. As a relatively still small part of the overall healthcare expenditure, we are, you all are um, a part of the solution. And there, there still are tremendous pools of capital, not just investment capital, but expenditures in healthcare that need to be dislocated to more cost-effective uh, alternatives. And, and we're a big part of that. So you should assume that over time, not just in the next three, six, 12 months, but five, 10, and 15, and 25 years, our categories will continue to expand because we are a necessary part of the cost-effective shift in overall delivery of healthcare. And the last point I would make is that, and Jay alluded to this, we are moving at a faster pace. Decisions get made faster, investments, speed to market, although regulatory, clinical, none of that has, has necessarily shortened. Overall pace 
of change is faster than it's ever been. And it just demands that you be agile. Uh, there's, there's, um, it's, it's a young person's game in a lot of ways, but if you can stay at it for a long time, the one ingredient that will determine your success is your ability to be agile uh, in, a, in a marketplace that is uh, ever more demanding for speed. Yep. That's great. <clears throat> Jay, Leslie, Paul, thank you for helping us set the tone for this meeting. Everybody here, thank you for participating. Yeah, Let's uh, pleasure. give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.